this is Headache Halo from David's Tea. The description of it is a rooibos tea that will offer cool and simple relief. No, 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 that's not going to do it, that's not going to do it at all, not one bit, no, cheers granddad. So, I just came back from seeing New Mutants and Tenant. Let's get into it. Uh, first, I saw New Mutants. New Mutants is directed by Josh Boone and written by Josh Boone and Nat Lee. This movie tells a story about five kids. Mostly focusing on one of them. Her name is Danny, and she's a Native American girl who a crazy tragedy happens at her reservation. And the kids are all in this treatment facility. It's actually kind of this little town. They're in this secluded little town. And we're told by this doctor that they are in this area to discover who they are, and what their powers are. Well, mostly who they are through their powers, essentially. That's the whole story. Now, the kids are there. Each of them has varying reasons for why they're there. Most of them have to do with a trauma or a tragedy of some kind. And they also are there for some reasons that we don't really know. Now, I apologize in advance. I am going to go into detail with this movie, as well as Tenant, later. New Mutants is a movie I have no understanding of. I don't know who the New Mutants are. I know that they're X-Men characters. I've heard that this film has been in development for years, or at least release development. I, I don't know. I've, I've heard about this film, I don't know, since 2019 or something. And I wasn't excited to see this movie. I was going to wait to see it uh, before it got released into video. I was going to wait. But then I saw a trailer for it, and I got interested for one particular reason, and one particular reason only. I was very impressed by the look and feel of this movie from the trailer. The trailer paints this film as like a superhero movie, that's also in kind of a psychological horror environment. For me, I've never seen that before in a superhero film. Probably the only, the closest thing we have at this point is the Joker from The Dark Knight. And maybe before then we had Blade, but I mean, and maybe Spawn, but I'm not counting Spawn ever. It's a little rare to see this kind of style be done, but I mean, X-Men has done really well, at least most of the properties have done well when it comes to genre or, what's the word, um, blending genres in with superhero films. You see it with Logan when they have a, kind of a western thing going on, and, um, I don't know, Deadpool kind of breaks the fourth wall. They were able to get away with it, where I don't think, you know, the Disney-associated Marvel could really get away with it as well. Anyway. I was going into it with that expectation of the atmosphere. I was really going in for that. And that's kind of a mistake. I, I had two major problems with this film. Well, one thing I did like. The biggest problem that I have with New Mutants is something that my mom brought to my attention when we both saw Rocket Man in theaters. She said that she doesn't like the convention or that cliche or that story-written element to help characters introduce themselves through therapy. 
I've seen it in plays, and I've seen it in movies. A therapy session is simply for a character to justify opening up emotionally when they themselves would not open up emotionally. It's written as a situation where they have to open up because it's therapy. The thing is, and this is something that I kind of paid attention to when my mom said it, and I really paid attention to with this movie. The therapy doesn't mean anything beyond the fact that it's therapy. That might sound confusing, but I can articulate it this way. There is a movie out there that you might remember me talking about called Hereditary. Hereditary is the only film I can think about that has a kind of therapy session that actually means something beyond the fact that it's a session. It is one of the most powerful therapy sessions that I've seen in films in terms of a narrative use of it because it's more than just a character having to open up emotionally. You could even say like Fight Club has the same thing. You know, back in the 90s the Fight Club came out and that film gave a reason for therapy to be there aside from just being therapy. It was a thing for the character to open up emotionally in a world that didn't you know, he just wasn't emotional about. So it was it works like that, but but New Mutants doesn't do it like that. It's simply just there. It's just there for the generic purpose of, you know, we see the characters in different exercises opening up and showing off their personality. It's it's just a framing device for them. It's not anything beyond therapy. And what's worse is that it's not the only use of it. There's a lot of things like that that open up our characters through some contrived situation that opens them up. And sure, in other situations, like I just said with Hereditary, it can work. But in this movie, it doesn't work because we don't know who these characters are. Uh, like a, a movie that doesn't use therapy beyond therapy, A Star is Born, for instance, that movie isn't, that therapy doesn't happen until much later when we know who Jackson is when he goes to therapy. This movie has so many moments where the characters are opening up about themselves, but we don't know who they are. We are introduced to the majority of this hospital because of a therapy session. And we don't know who our characters are yet. We don't even know who our main character who we're following through this place, Danny, is at this point. So we're just introduced into this therapy session, and we don't have a baseline for who our characters are, except Danny's afraid. And she doesn't know where she is. We don't know where we are. So yeah, we're Danny. Oh, congratulations, screenwriter. You just made me realize we're Danny. Well, you know what? I don't want to feel like Danny was lost in your story. I want to relate to Danny. I want to sympathize with Danny. I want to understand Danny. I don't want to take on the interactive video game experience of I'm playing Danny, walking through the 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 hallways of this of this asylum oh i must press x to open the door that takes me to therapy that's not what this medium is it's not interactive i'm witnessing something take place and it's not the only instance there's an instance in this film that actually bothers me the entire environment that i was so excited for feels wasted in this movie it's just there because you know troubled people go to a hospital uh, troubled people, you know, need to be locked away. Like, that's it. There's five characters. They're all locked away. Okay, six, if you can count the doctor. But they're all locked away. They're all put in this little bubble, and there's nothing for them to really do. And what bothers me so much about this is that there's a moment, actually, where we get a scene where they're told there's a place where we can go where no one can see us, where we're co completely alone. And it's a place that's has stuff before this place was like a hospital or before this place was what it was. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Because we're going to see maybe these characters, uh, like, I don't know, find something interesting that they uh, relate to, like even just briefly. Because again, I don't know what comics th that these characters are from comics, so I don't know what, you know, re they're related to or what they are attached to. So I don't know who they are at this point, but maybe we'll find something. And the only thing that we see them pull out in this entire place is something that's already associated with the hospital. It's not associated with this exact hospital, but it's like a lie detector. It's a polygraph. And 
they basically just play tr truth. Not truth or dare, truth. Which is another thing that characters do to open up. So basically, every single way that our characters open up, aside from a couple emotional moments, is basically through contrived written situations where any character would have to basically tell the truth or lie and blah 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 blah. That's it. That's it. That's all it is. And it free bothers me. I'm just... I was so irritated by that point that I didn't care what they said. The first, you know, first therapy, I gave it a pass. The second time, I'm like, okay, there's a couple chuckles I got from it. Other than that, I didn't care. And then this thing happens, by the time that, that polygraph happens, I'm done. I'm just done with the situations. I don't care who these characters are. Because by that point, we're almost halfway through. And I still don't know who these characters are from any of their actions, from really anything. I know who, what kind of personality-wise, their personalities are archetypes. You know, there's the, there's a really sad, quiet guy who's southern, and he's really, you know, he beats himself up all the time with his powers, and he's really sad. And then you have the Russian girl, who's a very, very bad girl. She's very bad indeed. Oh yes, she's bad and she has a puppet on his on her hand. It speaks to it, and she doesn't like our protagonist at all. Oh, and there's this really hot guy. Oh yeah, he's really hot. Oh, he's so hot, he wants you to have sex. Ooh, he's so hot. Mm. Blow me. You have the one character who I actually do like, kind of. It's the girl from, from Game of Thrones who plays Arya. She is playing a character who has a very interesting backstory. I don't love how it's told. I do like one cinem cinematography moment that happens. I think it's really cool. Other than that, you kind of learn a bit about her, but here's the thing. She's the character that's close to Danny. And she's the character that Danny relates to. And she, Danny keeps talking. Oh, I've never met somebody like you. Oh, you, I care about you so much. But the thing is, Danny doesn't talk really to anyone else in this place. Except for the douchebag Russian girl who we know really hates her. So really, it's no surprise that she likes her. Of course she likes her. Of course she cares about her. Because she's the only one who's talking to her. She, there's nothing special to her that isn't already special about everybody else in that place. They're all like tainted they're all hurt in some way so really there's no nothing except you know she's uh, played by Arya Stark the second thing that I really didn't like in this film it's a little bit of a personal thing I think the biggest theme in this movie is all about control controlling of oneself finding control over your powers basically attaining control when you yourself feel you don't have any and honestly I like that theme especially with young mutants and, I, and that's not something that I think we've really seen. And it's something I wanted to see more, except... One of my biggest problems is that the big catharsis from this film, at least... W when everybody's, like, finding control, or when people are trying to discover control... A lot of it is done in isolation. The characters... There's not a lot of teamwork in this film where they kind of discover their strengths together so I don't feel like they're a great unit so at the when they're you know, trying to figure out how they you know can come together or any good moments where like oh well yeah, we're we're a team or we're, we're, we're working together it's all done in isolation and I get it they're not like a developed team they're strangers but at the same time I feel like the moment or the element in this film that's so powerful can really make a great team element but everything is kind of done in isolation. They're they're all, you know, closed off. And it's kind of a problem I have with the setup of the movie is that everybody's closed off, and we're just kind of along for the ride. And we're nobody's really allowing themselves to be vulnerable. And even when we think they are, they're not really. And it's just, and when they do, like I said, the characters just don't associate well enough with each other. There's even a moment in this film where Danny is getting to know all of the characters, not from each of the characters, but because someone's telling her about the characters. And telling them kind of like pretty blunt facts about these people right when they're in the hearing vicinity, which, good grief. But again, that whole thing with isolation, it's just a personal thing. 
I don't know if it's the worst thing in the world, but it definitely feels like the film just has no interest in making these characters feel like they're connected to each other. It, it just, you know, and that's something that I felt was kind of a shame. It just kind of felt mean and spiteful and, you know, just, uh, there's no reaching out, I guess. But I should say the one thing I did like. There's an element to this film where you start to realize a person's powers. At the beginning, I was a little bit annoyed with some of the, I'll say, flashback elements that I was seeing. When I found out one thing about somebody's abilities, I, I kind of was like, oh, I kind of see why that happened. And there's one moment in this film, it's just a moment that I actually really like. It involves the character Sam, who's a, a lonely, you know, southern guy. He has this really great moment in a bathroom that kind of shows what I love about the idea of teenaged, angsty, loner, angry, traumatized superhero. All those things are expressed in one single moment. I thought that was pretty good. And I'll say this, I like the character personalities. Sorry, I like the actor personalities. The girl who plays a Russian girl, she's the same actress from The Witch and Thoroughbreds. I'm not sure if I've liked her uh, acting, but I really love her personality. And I really like all of the actors' personalities in this film. I think they utilize the space pretty well. I think they got presence. I, I just don't think they're given much to work with in this film. It's a real shame, because honestly, I don't see much problem with this idea or this concept. I, I think that, you know, New Mutants could have been something, maybe not perfect, but it definitely could have been something that could launch something more. And I do hope it does. Because I feel like this whole psychological horror, you know, world is kind of wasted and I was a little bit underwhelmed by it. And I feel like they could go somewhere with that. They could just drive straight towards, they could go like above and beyond if they really wanted to because there's some really cool ideas here. And then after a while I just kind of got tired with it. I started laughing at parts that were goofy and I was the only person in the theater. Thanks COVID. <laughs> And now we go to Tenant. Yippee. This movie is directed and written by Christopher Nolan. It's about a protagonist called Protagonist. <laughs> he basically works as a agent of some kind who's recruited to be a part of this society or group or agency to stop a world threat. It's about a man who's trying to find out all the find all the complicated pieces to figure out how to stop this world threat. But here's the thing. This man needs to find out about this one very interesting element. There's a twist to it, don't you know? And this twist is inversion. Oh, you don't know what that is? Well, silly, silly fool. Let me explain it to you. Wait, no, I don't want to explain it to you because the movie spent like 15, 20, goddamn, maybe even more minutes trying to explain it to me. Except. It's not trying to explain to me. No, 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 the explanation doesn't matter. Asking details about this thing doesn't matter. Asking details about this new thing you've invented for your movie doesn't matter. No, 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 no. It's all about the feeling, don't you know? No, it's all about the feeling, how you feel. How does it make you feel when you see this thing? And they talk about that, too. And then they talk about that feeling. They talk about that. They talk over and over and over and over again about this thing that's all about the feeling. All about feeling. Now let me explain this thing to you. Let me explain it to you for the next three, four, seventy minutes of your life. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna really invest you into this story, this really cool espionage story. This kind of cool story that's like classic old time spy mixed with really cool modern cinematic elements. It's gonna be really cool, don't you know? It's gonna be really cool, you're gonna be really interested. And all of a sudden we're gonna talk about this inversion stuff because, oh yeah, I'm gonna talk about that because it's so essential in the movie. It's so essential, so 
essential all the time. It's so essential, don't you know? You gotta do it all the time. It's so important to my story, my big cinematic film that I must release out into theaters and risk people getting sick over it because they're not gonna listen to COVID sanctions. No, we must have people pay attention. They must pay attention to my film that's all about inversion when there's a really cool espionage story all about world domination, world destruction. Basically, it's like James Bond, except with modern technology. I mean, they already have that, but it's so cool because it's Christopher Nolan, don't you know? And we have inversion. Inversion is so interesting because you can catch a bullet. Oh, that's right. Catch a bullet. You don't shoot bullets. You catch it. No, you didn't f let that gun fall. You didn't pick that gun up. You dropped the gun, but it came to your hand. How did I do that? Well, let me show you on this camera. Yes, this camera shows you that you dropped the gun rather than picking up, but it showed you that you were picking it up at the same time. And I'm going to show you in so many different ways that the inversion is working. And this inversion doesn't just happen in one timeline. No, 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 no. It's not just a thing that occurs. It's actually creating time travel, don't you know? There's time travel machines in this movie, don't you know? Yes, 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 indeed. There's time travel in this film. Oh, yes. Yes, there's time travel. And we have to go into certain machines. And then we have to synchronize our watches to do certain time heists and time things with military. And then time heists and military people are doing a bunch of things. And they're just allowing themselves to go into this time heist. And it's so amazing, don't you know? We're going on this time heist, everybody. But it's not a time heist. No, 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 no. It's actually a military plot. Yes, it's a military plot to save the world. And everybody's going to have a grand old time with it. We're all going to have a grand old time going off on our little... I am so annoyed with this movie. I walked into this movie and I was so... I wasn't excited because I've been really wondering if I actually like Christopher Nolan's films. Not even just Christopher Nolan's films in general. But I've been having a problem recently. And I was having a problem with Inception. It's the 10th anniversary of Inception. So I watched that film in theaters a few days ago. I saw it. And I kind of came up with some ideas. I was actually going to do a review for it. Nevertheless, I went to this film very curious. John David Washington. I liked him in Black Klansman. And I was very, very, very interested to see what this film was about. Because when Inception was playing in the theater, that film basically had a 15-minute Blu-ray behind-the-scenes playing in the theater that you could not, you know, you didn't ask for it, but you got to see it. So basically seeing a whole bunch of big set pieces and, and, and characters talking about, people talking about the film. So there was a lot of a lot of stuff being interesting. And I really was interested in the teaser trailer for this film. So I decided, you know, let's go see it. I feel like this film doesn't need the stupid inversion thing. It's Ridiculous. It's only done so that Christopher Nolan and his production team and everybody who's creating cinema nowadays can just show us something we've never seen before. You've never seen a movie like this before. So he's just trying to create something that is new. And you know what? I saw some things in this movie I've never seen before. And I don't want to see them in movies again. I'm tired of this kind of movie. I'm tired of it. Because let me explain something to you, okay? Let me explain it to you. The thing that I'm tired of is a gimmick or a concept or some weird kind of storytelling thing that you input into your movie and you use to complicate your story, which is fine on its own. But you use it and you integrate it into the story so that is essential. But the thing is, it's pulling us away from the drama and the emotion of the film. And rather, we're focusing on the technical aspects, the technical wonder and marvel of your film. But we are completely hollow. Sorry, not we. I. I don't like to generalize. I am completely pulled out emotionally from your film, Chris. I'm sorry. You've been making great films for 
Sorry, Maggie. I'm sorry I'm annoying you. You've been making great films. And I still stand by a lot of your films. I'm going to bring up a few of your films to mention why I don't like this movie. One of the things that I thought was so interesting that I was actually on board with, and I was a little lost, because I didn't think you really, I don't know, edited your film so well. It was like jumping right between one scene and another so fast. I couldn't really catch up. I was like, well, well how did a character get to this point? How did a character get to this point? I wasn't thinking it was perfect. I was probably going to give it like, I don't know, an eight or seven, maybe a seven, if I was going to be generous about like a midway through this film. You were interesting me in your espionage. Your spy movie was cool. Your spy character was cool. I wish you didn't name him protagonist. And I wish you didn't name your characters the antagonists. But you basically made a film that I was interested in when it came to the espionage. I was very interested in the core story, what your film was about. It was all about a man who's like, you know, come back from a very difficult situation and then he's given a second chance and through the second chance he's able to save the world. Like, I thought that that was such a cool concept. I was following along, but then I was starting to notice these elements, and there was stuff that I was like, okay, I'm noticing this cool thing, a cool thing, but I don't care because I'm more invested in the present moment. Your present story is more interesting than your little sneak peeks of, uh, oh, do you guys notice that thing? Do you notice that thing? That means there's an inversion happening. And the inversion to me doesn't make sense. Maybe that's one thing. To me, the inversion doesn't make sense. Or at least I'm not given enough establishment to understand how the inversion works. But also, by the time I start to learn about it, I don't care about it anymore. Okay guys, I know a lot of people who are Christopher Nolan fans who watch this are gonna start saying, Oh, you don't get it because this is what he was meaning. This is the whole thing about it. This is the technical thing. Sorry, I know you don't sound like whiny people, but I'm doing that voice because I want to. But basically, you don't understand Christopher Nolan. He's a, he's a cinematic genius. And here's the thing. I don't care enough to, to, to worry about the technical thing. I don't care enough because I don't care about the story. I don't care about the individuals. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care what their motivation is. Oh, and one character keeps stating what their motivation is the entire time in this movie. They keep bringing it up every single time to remind us that there's a human element. And you know what? I don't care because I don't even know who this person's motivation is. Seriously, this person's motivation is a person? Is an actual person? And I don't know who their that person is. So I don't care what their motivation is. Because I never see them interact with each other. I see it maybe twice. And both times is standard relationship BS. So it's nothing special. There was one set piece that I thought was cool, and that was it. There's a lot of times where I was asking, oh, how they do that? how they do that? how they do that? That's so cool. But you know what? I'm just tired. I'm tired. I'm done. I'm done. You know what? I'm done asking how they do that? how they do that? I ask that question once I'm invested in a film for long enough, and I start paying attention to the shots and what it means, I start caring. I start, you know, investing my time, diving deeper, how they do that. My dinner with Andre, how'd they write that film? 12 Angry Men, where did it come from before this? Was it a play? Apocalypse Now, how'd they do that? The Dark Knight, how'd they do that? You understand? Does it make sense? The Dark Knight has a very good example of this. In Tenet, there is a scene where characters are hijacking a convoy. Okay? Just like in The Dark Knight, when Harvey Dent exposes that he's Batman, they put him into a, a cop car, they're transporting him to a prison, and there's a convoy. We have a feeling that this convoy in The Dark Knight is going to be intercepted. 
However, we know that the Gotham Police Department, we know who these guys are. We know how they work. They're a functioning unit. We don't necessarily know the extent of their protection, but we do know what their goal is. We know what they're doing. And then, what happens in this in The Dark Knight, we then later see that the Joker is starting to implement his plan. And we start to notice that there's some weird things. And we start to notice that there are things that the Joker is doing that is going to divert the convoy to a path that the Joker has planned out. We don't know the antagonist's plan. We don't need to know their plan. We just need to know what they're after and that the protagonists have what they're after. And then as we start to pay attention in the present moment, we start to notice, oh, they're putting them on a track where they're gonna lose and we start to be surprised when things happen. And we know the Joker well enough at this point to understand that he has planned contingencies or you know, ideas or you know, potential ways to interrupt the convoy or put them in a tough spot. In Tenet, there's a convoy, and I'm sure they talk about it in the film, but I don't know what really what they're after. I think they're after plutonium, I don't know. I think it's plutonium, but basically I don't really know who's involved with the protagonist plot, if that makes sense. I know that during the Dark Knight, it's just the police department. And then Batman is also involved. So those two elements, Batman is away from the police, they're separate. Batman's gonna do his own thing while the police have to follow their path. So Batman has to do something around what the police are doing. He has to, he has to catch them at certain points. He has to know the city well enough to get to certain points. With Tenant. I don't know who's on the protagonist side. I don't know who they're utilizing. I don't know who the antagonists are utilizing. I don't really understand what's going on at this present moment, so I'm confused. I'm lost in the moment. And yeah, there's some cool moments that, and things that are happening, but then I get lost. And then what bothers me so much is that when I'm starting to try to understand the espionage and heist moments of this film, it interrupts it with the inversion stuff, which I just... I, I don't, it bothers me so much. It's so annoying because yeah, it offers some really cool stunts and set pieces. And the thing is though, the action scenes aren't filmed well. There's one scene that's actually filmed good, but that's mostly because of what's utilized and it doesn't have to do with this inversion thing. It's actually just a spy action scene. It, it's showing John David Washington be an awesome protagonist, but he's just being a kick-ass character. But the, the fight in the inversion thing isn't filmed well. So I really just don't care. And, and you know, again, that's just, that's the biggest problem. I don't care. By the time this movie's over, almost over, I'm just rolling my eyes laughing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care anymore. And it's ridiculous. Why? Why the, why? Why is it so important to make a movie that, uh, that is so just, just talking about exposition all the time? And I get it. You need to explain your characters and motivations and everything. But you know what? You can do it in a way that isn't just simply just characters explaining a made-up situation that you've come up with. And I'm sure Christopher Nolan did his research, but you know what? I don't come to the movies to do homework. That's the thing with Inception 2 when I saw it again. I had a headache watching that movie. Now, granted, Inception has more human moments in it. There's more banter in between. There's a lot more fun going on with other characters. But there's still the same level of homework. It's explaining a world that's made up and new to us and yada 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 but at least I understand the character's goal it didn't feel like there was a personal stake in this game if I may quote John David Washington's character from Black Klansman how come you ain't got no skin in the game he has no skin in the game there's nothing for him in this, except a piece of ass. But let me state, I don't think the movie's bad. It's decent. 
maybe it's okay. Like I say, subjective and objective, that's how I look at the films. I don't, I don't judge it based on my personal things, and that's it. Like, objectively, there's some very impressive, there's a lot of impressive stuff in this. But I don't care enough about it. Like, this is one of my least favorite films I've ever seen. Congratulations. It's not the worst film I've ever seen. It's not one of the worst films I've ever seen. It could never be that. But it is one of my... It was just an endurance test for me to be like, I don't care. There's even parts where I'm just like, wait, that doesn't make sense with the rules that were just explained to me. So I'm confused. I don't care enough. And I'm done. I'm done. I hate it. Let me explain to you guys the difference between New Mutants and Tenet. New Mutants, when I came home, maybe go, yeah, it wasn't great. And I just went on with my day. Tenet made me sit down, make tea, made me bring this puppy over, made me bring this dude, made me sit down for a long time and construct a review. And that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Guys, thank, thank you so much for being here today. I don't like to do videos like this because honestly, I have nothing against the people who make these films. I just judge the art. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, be a jerk against Christopher Nolan or, you know, Josh and and and, and Nat. I, I don't. That's not fair. It really isn't. And anybody involved in this film, I'm not angry at them. I just don't like the products. I, I do that with everything. I do that with all, you know, art and and, and results, basically. I, I, I don't have anything against the people. I criticize the work. I criticize the product. You know, it's... And that's it. That's all this is. Go see it if you want to. I encourage you to do that. Figure it out for yourself. But I'm not going to see these movies again. I don't want to. I'm done. Take care. Oh. Bye, guys. Let's see.